Hello and welcome to Stay Paid, the sales and marketing podcast from Reminder Media on a mission to help you close more deals and retain more business so you can live a life of freedom tomorrow, but only... What, you watch Braveheart if, recently? He's like free, he's like yelling Come freedom on, on the podcast. <laughs> only if you take action today. I'm Josh Steich. And I'm Luke Acree. And maybe Braveheart today on this podcast. I haven't watched Braveheart in a long oh, time. Oh, man. Braveheart, time. Gladiator, Patriot. What a great speech. Oh, such good, inspiring movies. If you need to be just jacked up and inspired to be a hero, go watch those movies. <laughs> well, today on the podcast, we have an amazing guest. His name is Sean Carpenter. Sean is a realtor with 20 years experience and has been recognized by Inman News as one of the top 100 most influential leaders in real estate. Most recently, awesome. he's founded Sean Speaks and has been using that to consult and inspire his audiences on topics like creating memorable customer experiences, maximizing social and digital media, as well as business planning, leadership, and sales. His philosophy is build relationships, solve problems, and have fun. Sean Carpenter, welcome to the podcast. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you? Oh, man, it's fantastic. I am excited. I am excited to have you on. We were just chatting a little bit, guys, before this podcast, and I was reading Sean's bio and everything that he's accomplished. I encourage you, grab a pen, grab a piece of paper, oh, take it's notes. It's great. Oh, this guy is going to bring some gold, I know, and especially the reason why I know this is because something he told us right before we came on this podcast, that he still practices real estate as well, I asked him the question, hey, what are you passionate about? What what is what are you really focused on? And he's really passionate on this coaching and, and speaking that he's doing, but he still practices real estate because he wants to make sure he still ties himself to the realities of the business. He doesn't coach principles that aren't true. So everything you're going to hear today is stuff that he has experienced in his life. He's tested. He's practiced on his own or he's used with other agents. So buckle up, grab your pen, grab your notepad if you're driving. <laughs> I don't know. Speak no, notes, speak notes into your yeah. phone. Do you ever do that? I've well, done that. This before. is recorded, so they can just listen yes, to it again. You can listen to it again over and over again, <laughs> rate it on iTunes. But Sean, super excited to have you, man. Uh, if you could just introduce yourself to our audience, we always ask everybody, just give us kind of your, you know, Cliff Notes version of your life. What brought you to where you're at today? Why did you get into real estate? Why are you doing this Sean Speaks now? So just go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience. Happy to, happy to guys. So I was uh, born in Billings, Montana. Not a lot of people born in Montana, but born in Billings, Montana. My dad uh, moved us to Cornell, uh, Ithaca, New York, where he got a job at Cornell, but then he quickly got a job at the Ohio State University. So we've been in Columbus, Ohio since the early 70s. I, I grew up in the shadow of Ohio State. My dad taught there for 29 years up until the day he died. Um, and when it was time to, to go to college, I wanted a school like Ohio State. But I'm not a big fan of winter. I'm a big golfer, so I wanted a school in the South, like Ohio State, big athletic program, big Greek system. So I went to school at University of Florida. Mm. After graduation, I was a golf pro for three years. Oh wow! Uh, not a tour, not a tour level pro, but a club level pro. I worked at a big resort course in Florida, and then I got a job in Cleveland, Ohio, at a private club closer to home. Uh, married a girl from from Central Ohio. Married a girl from my high school. So after three years in the golf business, I moved back to Columbus. I got a job in the beer business. Worked for the Miller and Coors distributor here in Central Ohio. Nice. And called on all parts of the city, but eventually ended up at the Ohio State campus was my territory. Now, guys, as you can imagine, if you ever want to sell a lot of beer, pick a spot where there's 55,000 <laughs> students. And that's a really, really good spot. Especially to sell isn't beer. Ohio known for partying? Am I getting it is that a, wrong? I, I think yeah, it's they, known they, for like... They have a good time. And, yeah, <laughs> he knows. So, <laughs> I, I did a lot of late nights and a lot of early mornings, and so I thought to myself, what would be a job where I'm going to drink beer and play golf? So I became a real estate agent uh, <laughs> in, 19, in 1998, uh, sold actively for four years, uh, loved, loved, loved being in the business, but we just had our first child, and so my company asked me if I'd become the manager of a branch office. I, mm. I loved sharing with other people, and I think, um, that's, I'm, not, I'm not sure where that comes from, um, whether it was my dad as a teacher or my mom as a teacher, um, but I, I love sharing with people. So when I became the manager, I loved the coaching and training part of it, but I hated the managing part of it. You know, I, I still got to sell guys. I still got to sell as a manager because I was selling when I would recruit agents. I would sell the my office. I would sell my company. I would sell the, the industry itself. Um, so I, I, I met with our boss and he realized that my passion was in the coaching and training side. And so they named me the director of training with our company in Columbus and Cincinnati. We're part of the NRT, all sole banker NRT companies. And so I was in charge of about 1,300 agents and all the training and education for new agents and experienced agents and company events and rallies and things like that. In uh, in 07, as part of that, I spoke at my first Coal Banker conference. And I just loved being up on the stage in front of an audience sharing ideas. You know, anytime I could share with somebody else, I, I was just that kind of agent that if something worked for me, 
I wanted to share it with the other agents in my office. And I'd come running back to the office saying, hey, guys, I tried this dialogue, or hey, guys, I tried this marketing, or hey, I, mm. I, I tried this thing. And um, I remember back in the day, I had a couple older agents ask me, Luke, they said, um, hey, why do you tell everyone else your secrets? Because these are your competition. And I was so shocked by that. I said, well, they're not my competition. They're my teammates. If, they, mm. if, if everyone in this office gets more listings, that means our phone rings more. If our phone rings more, we That's get more powerful. opportunities with buyers and sellers. And so I, I just love to share because, look, no one's going to do it the way I do it. You guys have a great podcast. There are other great podcasts out there. No one's going to steal your ideas because they can't steal Luke and Josh and, and, and Matt behind That's the mic. That's a golden nugget. Right? <laughs> so, so just, you know, well, there's 1.4 million of us, 1.3 million realtors out there. Not everyone's going to do it the same way. And so I, I love to share. Uh, long story short, I started speaking around the country. And in uh, 2016, my – my daughter was heading off to college in the fall and uh, kind of decided to bet on myself and, and, and open up my Sean Speaks, as, as Josh said in the introduction. And But I wanted to go back into sales because, first of all, I missed being in sales. I love the relationship opportunities you have in, in, in real estate sales. But I felt it kept me credible when I was talking to my audiences and my coaching candidates that you know I was actively doing things that, that I was teaching them to do. And we'll, we'll get to it in a bit. But I love that. You know, I had to do the – I had to – as soon as I left the role, the employee role, I had to start living my life as an independent sales contractor, right? Uh, paying my insurance and paying, and oh, I don't have my taxes and not having a 401k, so sitting aside money and, and, and doing the things it takes to be successful. And so that's kind of where I'm at today. So, you know, it's interesting just hearing your story, the mindset of abundance that you have um, just, you know, I don't know if people picked up on that, but I wanted to point that out is this mindset of abundance. When you think about your competition and you're like, they're not competition, they're teammates. And we interviewed a guy, Ricky Carruth, who talked about the same type of idea, but he sold it and there's no shortage of home sales. Like he talked about in the recession, there's no shortage of homes. Like right. there's no shortage. Why are you scared that somebody's gonna, there's no shortage of homes. You can't sell every home out there. It's that mindset of abundance that drives success. So I wanna dive into really your it, philosophy. Go let, ahead. Let, yeah. me, let, me, let me jump in on that. Cause it's, it's, it's funny, I have a presentation that I've created I mean, it's called getting in tune with your audience. What real estate rock stars can learn from real rock stars. And it's kind of a history of tour, the history of rock and roll overlaid with real estate. And there's a great quote by Glenn Fry, the lead singer of the Eagles, obviously passed away a couple years ago. But he said, you know, when he was young in the business, he used to think that other people making good records was a, was a hindrance to his. And then he realized that other people making good songs can't keep him off the charts. Mm. You know, think about this at the same time, the Beatles, the Stones, the Beach Boys, Bob Dylan were all at the peak of their game for the for the greatest singer songwriter bands of all time. Yet they all sold millions of albums because there were enough ears that. to go around. There was enough <laughs> ears to go around, and, and there's enough. Every single opportunity out there that we face is is an opportunity to to help someone with a real estate need today or tomorrow or someone that they know today or tomorrow. And so it's just, I agree with you, man, hundred percent abundance. Dude, I love that. Everybody, I tell people this all the time when it comes to small businesses, any business really, but service-based businesses, every single person you meet, I call them a lead, but every single person you you meet is someone that can turn into a client of your business. Your job is to build a relationship with them, to give value to them. This mindset of abundance is super powerful. It's worth the whole podcast, guys. If you just understand that one shift in your mind, it's worth the whole podcast for you because when you start waking up and, it, and understand this, it is a choice. A mindset of abundance is a choice. Most people will hear us talk about this right now and go, well, I don't have a mindset of abundance. Well, you have to choose to. And this is if you follow Tony Robbins and stuff, and they talk about affirmations, and they talk about those things. Like you, you have to condition your mind to be in a mindset of abundance because we're so conditioned to go to negativity. We're so conditioned to contract instead of expand. But anyways, let's get into your philosophy, right? So you have this tagline, build relationships, solve problems, and have fun. And I just want to kind of, you know, riff on this a little bit and understand really what you're getting at here and how it translates. We have a lot of real estate agents that listen to this podcast, different points in their career, new agents just coming on board in the industry, veteran agents, and then agents that are probably not living the life they want to live. And they feel like they're on this hamster wheel. Could you walk us through what this means, this tagline, and then how it applies to how an agent can really live an abundant life, how they can live a life where real estate is not running them, where they're actually running the real estate business? Yeah, thanks, Luke. I'd love to. I, you know, 
when you really break down what our business is about and really any sales, because I think this translates to any sales business, whether it's marketing, sales, products, services, if you think about what we do every day, build relationships, solve problems, and have fun. Now, the have fun is optional, as you, as you know, but like, like you just said, it's a choice. And if and you have beer, can, I mean, it's, it's yeah, pretty it helps easy. Oh, sorry. Any, yeah, no. Anytime you can have fun. <laughs> but listen, um, build relationships. If every single day in sales you can be building a relationship, either a new relationship with someone that you've never met or deepen a relationship with someone that you've known for years, if you can help those people solve their problems – and whether they're real estate related problems or not, if someone is good at solving problems, when they have a real estate problem, they're probably going to call that person who's good at solving problems and also is in real estate. And if you can have fun doing it, I just think that that becomes worth talking about. And, and, and that's a big pitch I'm on right now is, is if I can get other people to tell my story for me, then I don't have to spend my time, effort, and money telling my story. Mm, yep. Right? Seth Godin, the great Seth Godin said, that our job is to turn strangers into friends turn friends into customers, and then the most important thing to do is turn those customers into salespeople. Get those customers to tell others about us, mm. right? To, to be no like and trust, but then get them to try you. When mm -hmm. they try you, they buy from you, and if they're willing to buy from you, they'll hopefully be willing to repeat business. And if they're willing to repeat business, they're willing to refer business. Oh, so so if good. every day, <laughs> if every day I can get people to, to build a relationship with, to solve problems with, and, and look, that can be in person, or as we might talk about later, it can be through social media. It can be through digital because I can, no one can, 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 can say that Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube allows me to build relationships further and faster and freer than I ever could one-on-one -on -one in person. So it starts by building relationships, solving problems and having fun. If you do those three things every day, the houses, the listings, the sales, the products, the services will take care of themselves. So what does that translate to? So if I'm an agent listening to this, or really any business, like, but let's look at it from the real estate perspective because that's the industry you're in. Or, you know, what does that translate to in actions? And then, like, I call it operational leverage. We talk about it a lot on this podcast. It's like you implement tools in your business. You, you implement processes that you do on a daily or, like, things that you can implement to give yourself a leverage. So you can do, obviously, the things you're better at. But what does that look like? What are some of the operational things they need to implement? How, the, how did they need to attack their business from a process standpoint? Could you give us so some insight look, there? Yeah, let's talk tactics. And, and, you know, there's really two things an agent does with his or her day. They either do business development activities or they do business support activities. Mm. Business development or business support. I can take anyone's to-do list from the day or I can look at – I could follow you around for a week and just – I'm, I'm just going to draw a line down a sheet of paper – and say, is it a business development activity or is it a business support activity? Now, Josh, what do you think most agents spend most of their time doing? Business development or business support? Support. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, you're right. Business support. And, and, you know, I ask people why and they say, well, it's easier yep. and it has to get done. Keeps you busy. And I agree with that. Yep. But let me tell you, let me tell you why most people spend most of their time on business support. Because there's no rejection involved in business. <laughs> Amen. That's there a golden go. nugget, people. Listen but to there that. there is yep. no risk. in business development. But yeah, here's what yes. I know. If you spend all your time doing business support and not business development, there soon will be no business to, to support. support. <laughs> so if every day we have to treat our, our, our career, our, our opportunities like a, like a farmer every day in a field, right? Yes. We have to work the land. We have to put seeds in the ground. We have to fertilize and water and, and work the land and wait for the seeds to pop through and become a – you know, a plant. And we still don't have a harvest yet, do we? We still have to work the field yep. and, and, and prune and, and fertilize and water, and we have to wait and be patient. So when I jump back into sales, Luke, I kind of teased earlier, I had to do what I was teaching agents for 13 years to do. I had to, in order to grow my business from a real estate business and a speaking business, is I had to build relationships, solve problems, and have fun every day. So I created what I call my 4-H club. And, and what that means is every day when I get in the office, and I'm usually the first one in the office, I'm usually there before 8 o'clock, the first thing I do is I do the 4-H club. The first H is I do five handwritten notes, all right? Mm. Five handwritten notes. I and, and I start with thank you notes. Is there anyone I can thank from yesterday? Because as you know, thank you notes are the easiest notes to write. They almost write themselves. But if I don't have anyone to thank, I just write to the next person on my CRM a handwritten note. The second H is I run a hot sheet. Now, this is real estate specific, but a hot sheet is in the MLS where it shows you yep. the newest listings, the price changes, the, the in contracts, and the sales. And as I run through that, two reasons I do that, Luke. I was retraining myself on the local market, so I'd remember the street names and price points and things like that. But as I go through that list each morning, and it could be 10 houses, it could be four, 
how, however many is in my local market. I say to myself, do I know anyone that lives within a two block radius of that house? And if I do, I text them, I call them, or I email them that listing. <clears throat> and I just say, hey, just want to let you know that the house down the street had a price change. Or hey, that, that's just want to let you know the house in the next neighborhood uh, listed yesterday. So that that's just a little touch. The third H I do is happy birthdays. That's the first time I, I jump onto Facebook while I'm in the office, and I see which, which of my friends have birthdays that day. Now, let me, let me spend some time on this one because this is a gold one, a nugget, as you say. What do most of your friends do, Josh, on, on your birthday? What do most of your friends do? Most of my friends? You mean like on Facebook? Yeah. Yeah, simple happy birthday, happy birthday wall, message right? on the wall. Yeah, 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 see, that's actually not what most of your friends do. Most of your friends don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> If, yeah, if, if you, you have think, no friends, no. <laughs> if you think about it, if you have about 2,000 friends, on your last birthday, you probably got 200 people yeah. that mm. wish you happy birthday. Yep. So the fact is, most of your friends do nothing. So what I do is I don't just, just try and write happy birthday on your wall. I write a little bit more than happy birthday. So here's what happens. By about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Josh or Luke jumps on in their Facebook. It says, you know, uh, you have 84 notifications or 35 notifications. You're like, oh, my God, 35 more. And you scroll through your phone. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what was that that Sean wrote? And, and mine says something like, um, today's your birthday. Forget about the past. You can't change it. Forget about the future. It's not here yet. Forget about the present. I didn't get you one. <laughs> I hope you have a good year. Right? <laughs> Something funny. But here's what happens. Memorable. You're through. Happy. Yes. It's, and then they people go like, thanks, Carp. Funniest post of the day. Or Which means for that split second, I was in the top of my norm. Sure. Yes. Yep. And if it's someone that's a close friend of mine, I will send them a video text message. I will open up my phone. I will dial their text number. And I will hit record. And I will just simply say something like, hey, Luke, it's Sean Carpenter from Columbus. Hey, just want to wish you a happy birthday today, man. Hope you have a great day, a good year ahead, and may you have lots of opportunities to build relationships, solve problems, and have fun. Send. Dude, you're How amazing. simple is that? <laughs> but how many video messages do you get on your birthday? Probably not a lot. That is And then awesome. the last H, the last H is what I call my high fives. Now, I'm already on Facebook, so I do five likes on someone's, you know, five likes on my feed. I do five comments on my feed. I jump over to Twitter and I do five retweets or comments on people's tweets. I then jump over to Instagram and I don't just do five likes. I do five comments. All right. And that's critical because think about this guys with Instagram. It's become so easy just to scroll through and go like, 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 yep. like the end of a, at, when you, at the end of the day, when you look at your post, you're like, Oh my God, 85 likes or 115 likes, but three comments. What do you pay attention to? Comments. The comments. And you think of those people and you like their comments and you usually respond back yep. to their comment. So I do five comments. And the last, it, the last part of my high fives, is I do five random texts. So I just roll through my phone and I send five random texts and it could be as easy as, Hey Josh, hope you have an awesome day. Or Hey Luke, did you see the, the extra innings home run by Bryce Harper in the game last night? And I might send the link off YouTube or something like that. Just a, just a random little touch. Yeah. When I've done my high, my 4 H club. I then go across the parking lot to our Starbucks and get my coffee as my reward for putting seeds in the ground. <laughs> yeah, man. Now think about this. He's conditioning this, himself. By nine, yeah, oh. by nine o'clock, by nine o'clock in the morning, I've touched in some cases forty-five people. Yeah. Five handwritten notes. Let's say three uh, hot sheet touches, twelve birthdays, and twenty-five touches. That's forty-five touches. And how many of them were about real estate? Only three. Mm. Only the three from the hot sheet. I was just trying to get Sean Carpenter's name in front of somebody with a nice t touch so that maybe they think about real estate, they think of me, or when they think of me, they think of real estate. That's that's all I'm trying to do. 4-H Club, guys. It's it's almost too simple, isn't it? That is unreal. I mean, good gosh. Yeah. Like, we could – I don't want to end the podcast now, but we could literally end the well, podcast. The, the power I mean, of that was that, amazing. The man. power of that is you're actually – psychologically, I think you're leveraging what we said, like – most of our time goes into business support, which are the tasks that are repeatable and systematized. Mm. You're taking business development, turning it into a system where, not that you don't have to think about it, because you still have to be creative maybe on some of those video text messages, but it's repeatable, it fits within a scheduled amount of time, and it's building your business at the same time. Yeah, and it's it's allowing me then to do my servicing and my support activities right. in the late mornings and, and early afternoons. So then I can get out and, you know, have well, it's, happy hours or lunch or, or show houses yeah. or whatever I need to do. It's definitely better to do the more creative processes early in the morning because after lunch, you're you do tend to get burnout to that. <laughs> That's the better time to kind of as do we those have this you podcast have to at four thirty <laughs> in the afternoon. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, but uh, here's my question for you, just because I, I'm curious myself. 
How has this turned into leads for you as you've looked in your business and doing this? How does it translate so people have a, a good, healthy expectation of what they should be thinking? You know, hey, you're doing this because my thing is I see this as relationship <coughs> building. And if you focus on relationships and like you say, solving problems, which I say just give value, right? So you're giving value, you're solving problems, you're giving to people, that will translate tenfold of what asking for business will will do. But what's kind of the journey you've seen once you do these four H's consistently, how does it translate into a lead and what does that look like? Well, because I'm not actively just pushing a sale, I'm not, I'm not saying, do you know someone that wants to buy or sell a house or can right. I list your house or do you want to buy something? All I'm trying to do is earn that top of mind awareness when someone does have a need. If you think about real estate specifically, our, our, our business revolves around problems. Mm. There's good problems. We're having a baby. We're getting married. We got a job promotion. There's bad problems. Somebody died. We're getting a divorce. We lost our job. We're being foreclosed on things like that. So either way, we're, we're solving someone's problem. So my job is just to be someone they think of when they when they think of real estate. Uh, there certainly are, are, are approaches and, and successful agents out there that, that go after stranger business. They buy leads off Zillow or Realtor.com. Sure. They they buy leads off you know third party sources. I I just I think because that's who I am. I'd rather do business with a friend than than a stranger. Um, so I'll, my 4-H club is really just designed to be those drips, those those drops in the bucket. You know the ripple effect, Luke. If you think about it. The ripple effect is so powerful. The ripple effect basically says if I know 100 people and they know 100 people, I'm only one contact away then from 10,000 people. Mm. If they know 100 people behind them, I'm two contacts away from 100,000 people. But but here's what I ask people all the time. Would you rather know a lot about five people or nothing about 500? Mm. See, a lot of new people to our business say, well, I got to know a lot of people. So I'd rather know nothing about 500 and get to know them. So you want to take your time, effort, money to meet strangers instead of take your time, effort, money to get to know the five people really well, who every once in a while will turn around and tell their 500 behind them, hey, look at me up front, guys. Hey, if you need help, come see my friend Josh because he'll take great care of you. That's so good. See, that's who you want. To, so the ripple effect allows you to, to leverage that relationship. And so I'd rather know less people better. And so, so I'd rather them get my handwritten notes, my emails, my texts, my, so it jumps out at them. Than just sending random people something once a year or twice a year, you know, maybe it segues perfectly into the, the four levels I look at the real estate business, guys. And this translates probably into any marketing. I business, hope you guys are taking cool. notes. I literally already have like a page of notes on my Word document <laughs> in front of me. So I hope you guys are taking notes. Listen to this. <laughs> so, so the four levels of a successful business. Let's let's go from the top down. Okay, level one is called your database. Now that's what a lot of people just. They call their database, whether it's a legal pad or a CRM or Excel or whatever. Your database is comprised of anyone you have contact information for. So that's why it's the macro. It's the top level. Anyone mm -hmm. you have contact information for. Level two is your sphere of influence. Okay? Very simple definition. I know them and they know me. Now, it's really critical. Everyone in my sphere of influence is part of my database, but not everyone in my database is part of my sphere of influence, right? Because database was anyone I have contact information for. So, Luke, it might be the, all, the homeowners association that you're, that you're a member of, or, or Josh, it's, it's the roster of your gym membership, mm. or all the kids that play in your son's uh, baseball league, or, or people from your uh, you know organization in town, whatever it might be. But here's the thing. If Josh is on the way home from, from work tonight and he stops at the store to get milk, and in front of him is a neighbor that lives three blocks away that's in his homeowners association. And behind him is the is the third the third baseman's parent from the baseball league on your son's, you know, league. You they're total strangers to you. Right. So your sphere of influence number has to be a smaller number than your than your database. Let's go a level deeper. Level three, then, are your clients. They've done business with me in the past. So by definition, our clients are part of our sphere of influence because I know them and they know me, but they've done business with me. Now, notice I called them clients, not past clients. Yep. Mm. I think a lot of people in our business call them past clients as if they will never do business with us again, yep. but they are our clients. If I if I said to Luke or Josh right now, who's your dentist? And you say, it's Dr. Smith. If I called your dentist, Dr. Smith today and said, hey, who's Luke? He'd say, he's one of my patients. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't say he's one of my past patients. Mm. He'd say he's one of your patients. And so, so whether they are local or whether they've moved across the country, they're still your your client, yep. 
they could still move back. They could still refer you business. They still know people from work or school or church or where they're from. So that's level. And that number is how, how many people in your clients is just whatever the number is. Right, right. right? You should, everyone on this, on this, this podcast should be no, without even thinking, how many clients have you had? Yep. Because if you're running a business, you should know how many clients you've had. You guys are both, I'm guessing, old enough to remember when McDonald's had the number on the sign. Remember when McDonald's served. used to have a number on the sign that said 34 million served, yeah. eight, 38 million. And you know what it says now? Billions and yep. billions served. Yep. It's awesome. And, and, and they run a business like a business. They know how many hamburgers they've sold. Yet I talk to agents and I say, how many transactions have you done? They go, I don't know, like around 100 or oh. a couple hundred. Well, a couple hundred, that could be 200. It could be 400. <laughs> That's a huge difference. And so so I ask you, how many families have you served? Mm. How many families have you served? Because it, all of a sudden you think about that. And then let's go last level, guys. So we got sphere, we got database, sphere, clients, and the, the most important level is called your bullseye. Now, your bullseye has a cool definition. These people want my success almost as much as I want it myself. Mm -hmm. Now, the number in your bullseye should be 20. 20. So just if you're listening to this, write down a 20 and circle it. So I don't care how many is in your database. Your your sphere of influence is going to be a smaller number. Your clients will be a smaller number. But your bullseye is 20. Think about this. If these people want my success almost as much as I want it myself, the reason I picked 20 is let's picture a calendar up on the wall, right? A big calendar up on the wall. And I'm showing you guys a big calendar. Let's cut off the weekends, all right? How many business days are left? Mm. 20. 20. And so if, if Josh is one of my, let's say Josh was my best man at my wedding and, and Luke is a guy I play golf with every Saturday and it, and my, my wife's in my bullseye and my mom, my brother, uh, you know, my, my best friend, my neighbor, it's those 20 people that are looking out for your business on, on one day, Josh's name's going to be in there. And on another day, Luke's name's going to be in there. And another day, my brother's name's going to be in there. And another day, my wife's name's going to be in there. It just means on that day, I need to somehow make sure I talk to Josh. Now, I might talk to Josh three times a day through texts and stupid memes and things like that. But on that day, I reach out to Josh and say, hey, what's up, Josh? Hey, you want to get together for beer? Or, hey, Luke, what's going on, man? Did you see the game last night? I just need to make sure I touch him. I don't need to say, hey, Luke, do you want to buy or sell a house this week? <laughs> okay, I'm going to call you in 21 days and ask you again. These are the people that are listening for, for real estate opportunities. These are the people that will call you and tell you about a FISBO they saw down the street. These are the people that will tell you about their coworker who's found out he's getting divorced and is probably going to need to sell his condo in a, in a week. There, are, there, there will be people in your bullseye that have never done business with you, but they will still continue to send you business, right? And so, you're, so when you start working your bullseye, if you think about it, guys, if I had a dartboard in front of me, where do I get the most points mm -hmm. in the bullseye? Mm. If I'm th if I'm shooting archery or I'm throwing darts, I get the most point in the bullseye. But the problem is most people say, I already know those people. They love me. I don't need to prospect to them because they already love me. I need to build a bigger target because if I have more people to hit, I have a better target. Oh, so you want to spend your time, effort, and money building strangers into your business instead of spending your time, effort, and money on the people in the middle. Because if you're so busy, you only get this far into your bullseye, that means you talk to the best people. And tomorrow you so get this powerful. far and you talk to the best people. And it, these people out here on the outer ring are total strangers. So instead of being on the outside of your target, trying to push people into your business, be so good at delivering memorable experiences in the middle. You pull people into your business. People say, how do I get what Luke and Josh get? You got to be part of the Sean Carpenter fan club. You got to be part of the Sean Carpenter service plan. Right. And so those people, so the people on the outer ring might get my annual newsletter. The next ring in might get my 12, e-newsletters a month. The next ring gets that plus they get, you know, this. These people get my just listed cards. These people get invites to my quarterly happy hours. These people get in and the people in the middle get way more time, effort, and money. I spend my time, effort, and money on the people that have proven to me that they will give me their time, effort, and money to help me grow my business. Oh, that is so good. Man, right? that is so good. I love it. I, I mean, just to back it up, guys, for, from a statistics standpoint, um, because we're always looking at the data. If you look at the buyer you know, profile and seller's profile from NAR that they released for just 2018, you know, I haven't seen the latest that has come out and because I don't think they've released it yet. But the last one they released, 64 percent of real estate transactions that happened came from people using the agent they were referred to by a friend or they knew. And a just, relationship. Yeah, it's a relationship. a relationship. It's that bullseye that you're talking about. I guarantee you someone in that bullseye referred that person. And then there's another statistic that talks about the income, which is what we all care about is, you know, the money that we're making, the income. 
And it has this amazing graph. Maybe we'll post it on the statepaypodcast.com so you guys can see it. But it shows the level of income a real estate agent makes. And it basically has, you know, where it's going to cross and it shows $150,000. And almost like I think it's 50 or 60% of their business is coming from referrals. And as their business by referral goes down, their income drops significantly. And realtors who are making $40,000 a year are barely getting any of their business from referrals. We have a saying here, we call it take people from anonymous to advocates. The key in this business is to create advocates for your business that are referring you, that are your champions. And there's a key point that Sean mentioned in there that a lot of people make this mistake. I've made it in my own life. When people don't do business with you, you don't think they're an advocate. That's not true. That is... That one point right there can change, guys, so much of your business because when you start understanding that just because someone doesn't do business with you doesn't mean they're not an advocate is a huge opportunity for you to take advantage of. But a lot of us, because we're so intrinsic, you know, we're, we're looking internally, we're thinking, well, they didn't do business with me, so they're obviously not going to support me. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to help me. That is so untrue. Some of the best advocates, they don't do business with you. But I call them the chatty Cathy's or the influencers. They just literally. <laughs> the, the sneezers. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah. They just share with everybody. So here, what is the biggest mistake? So this is like gold. Like I've written this down, the database thing, the four H's. I mean, I love this. This is gold. What's the mistake? Why aren't people? It seems so easy. And I'm really, I'm not I, I, just saying that. It seems easy. Why are, why are 87% of real estate agents failing in the first five I, years and 90% of those failing within two years? I think because they're not building ships. You know, my friend Jeff Chalmers says building ships, partnerships, relationships, friendships, build relationships, oh goodness, solve problems, so have fun. Look, building, and that's credit to Jeff Chalmers. He's a great buddy of mine from Boston. But, but building, building is what we do every day, guys. Building relationships and building a business worth talking about. Right. When you give someone something to talk about, right, the, the Bonnie Raitt song, give them something to talk about. If I can deliver, it's not about great service anymore. Listen, it's mm-hmm. 2019. Great yep. service is expected. Yep. It's about memorable experiences. Mm-hmm. Memorable experiences are worth talking about. Yes. I think the biggest mistake, Luke, to answer your question is people, when they get into the sales career, they jump into real estate. And first of all, maybe they don't, they don't realize it's a, it's a sales business. They think it's a house business and our business has nothing to do with the house. It has to do with the people (laughs) in the house, right? But they, they, they fall into this sales thing and they say, I got to fill my funnel. I got to get my pipeline as full as possible. It's all about the funnel. And I get as many leads as I can in my funnel, hoping some come out the other end. If you think about a funnel, there's the big top and the small bottom, right? And, and people say, if I just show as many leads as I can in my funnel, who cares if I know them, like them, or trust them? If I can just get them to come out the other side, I make money. Mm. Well, I think we need to turn that whole idea of the funnel on its side. Just tip it over, and here's what we should do instead. We should build relationships, solve problems, have fun, pre-qualify, put the right people into the, into the pipeline, into the process. And then when they go through the process, they have an amazing experience. So when they come out the other side... They pick it up like a megaphone and tell everybody how awesome it was. I love that. Think about that. Put the right people into the process instead of anybody. Put the right people in. Deliver an amazing experience that's worth talking about. And then those people will not only become repeat customers, they will tell other people about your business. They will become your disciples, your salespeople, yep. and, and help you grow your business. If you have, if you build a business worth talking about, right? And, and I like to say if you catch people – being worth talking about, you start learning what makes people worth talking about. If you try and find people in your community, in your town, in your industry that you would tell their story, then say, I need to be more like that person. That right? Can I share a quick, st- can I share oh, a quick yeah. story with you guys? Yeah, please. So I talked about this in, in uh, one of my presentations, but there's a difference between great service and memorable experiences. So I'm at a conference in, in San Francisco. It's the first day. I'm down in the front. I'm an ambassador. So we're there texting and tweeting and Instagramming and videoing all the stuff we're seeing to our followers. And at lunchtime, the, 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 the morning session ends and the, and the speaker says, we're going to give you an hour and a half to go out and grab lunch, guys. Come back for the afternoon. we got a full afternoon. And he says, go. And the room just clears out. 800,000 people in the room. Everybody runs out to grab lunch, right? Because there's only so many restaurants near the hotel, so you got to get back in an hour and a half. So I'm folding up my laptop. I'm already arranged to meet my buddies across the street at a local diner, so they had already gone to grab a table. And as I shut down my laptop and started to walk out, I looked back at this huge ballroom. 
thousand seats. They're all kicked aside. They're all askew. There's trash on the floor. There's banana peels and there's coffee cups and newspapers. And it's just a mess. I'm the last person out of the ballroom. As I'm walking down the middle aisle, I look to my left and there's an employee and he's lining up the chairs with the lines in the carpet and he's touching every single chair. And I looked around the room really quick and I thought, well, there's, there's gonna be a thousand chairs in this room. There's no way he's going to do them all. And he did that row. And he did that row. And he did that row. And I was so impressed by this guy's commitment to making that room look good again. Instead of going to meet my friends for lunch, I walked back to the front row, opened up my laptop, and I wrote a blog post called, Are You the Chairman of Your Business? That is so are you, good. Are you doing things because it's the right thing to do? Are you doing things because it's going to make the next guy look better? Are you doing things because you know it's for the greater good? And it, it, you guys write a lot. I wrote this post, and I'm, I'm telling you guys, the words came from my heart or my head through my fingers, and I wrote this post, and I hit publish, and I ran to meet my friends for lunch. And I told them why I was late. And while they were while I was ordering, they all got their phones out and read my blog post. You know what they did? They hit share. Mm. See, my story about Marciano on that day at the Hilton in San Francisco went further and faster and freer because I shared it I shared what I call blog worthy experience, something worth talking about. It makes me want to be caught by someone in my community, in my town, in my career to, to want to be write a blog about me, Facebook about me, Instagram about me, tweet about me, tell my manager about me, tell my customers about me. Right. And when you start looking for people in your communities, in your towns, doing amazing things, you start doing amazing things yourself. Oh, my gosh. That is just amazing. Dude, man, that is inspiring. Uh, blog worthy, yeah. right? Being, wow. being worth talking about. And guys, look, at, the problem is with 1.3 million members of the National Association of Realtors is the consumer thinks we're all the same. Yep. And if we don't do something unique and different and be worth talking about, yep. then we're just the same. Yeah, um, man. I love that. Now, you know, that did put that song in my head, but now the good thing is every time you hear that song, you're going to remember that yeah, story. Give them something to talk Do about. something blog worthy. Give them something to talk about. Man, Sean, so that was fantastic. Memorable experiences. That's what it's about, guys. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for being here. I wish we had more time. and might have to have you back on again, go a little bit deeper into some of that stuff. But before we do close, let people know where they can connect with you, how they can find out your, your speaking and uh, follow your blog. Yeah, so I, I've been blogging for a little over 10 years at carpscorner.net. Carpscorner.net. I, I blog at least once a week. I post what I call my Monday morning match. It's a little story. It's a poem. It's a, it's a context of, of inspiration just to designed to spark your week. And then if I find something worth talking about during the rest of the week, I will post it. Um, so carpscorner.net, all the social channels I, I, I'm engaged on there. Uh, my go-to is Twitter at Sean Carp. Nice. You can also find me on Instagram at Sean Carp as well. So, um, and if I can help anybody, if you uh, have an event coming up, you want a presentation, a lot of my messages is, is what we just talked about. It's customer service. It's memorable experiences. It's uh, leveraging technology and digital to, to, to build more relationships, solve more problems, and have more fun. That's awesome. So, we'll make sure to put all that contact info into the uh, post for the show notes for this episode at staypaidpodcast.com as well. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked what you heard today here on Stay Paid, please go on iTunes. Give it a five-star rating. Make sure to leave Do a comment. It. Let Sean know what you yes. thought about that. You can also find this podcast in video on youtube.com slash reminder media or staypaidpodcast.com. Make sure to tell someone else about the podcast today if you liked what you heard. If you can get a hold of me or Luke, please email us at podcast at remindermedia.com. And you can now follow Stay Paid on Instagram. What's up? At Stay Paid Podcast. <laughs> Check it out. For this episode of Stay Paid, I'm Joshua Stike. And I'm Luke Acre, guys. And uh, meaning, I am just like lost for words. These, he has broken down the fundamentals of the business in such a succinct, easy to follow way. I would encourage you all to listen to this podcast again. I, I really can't say it enough. I have been coaching real estate agents for years now. I've had the privilege to work with, you know, last year alone, we worked with 38,000 small businesses. So I get the opportunity to see where people are succeeding and failing. And when I hear things that just, they touch, like they logically make sense to me in my mind, they, they line up to what I've heard in the past, but then more importantly, they touch what I go, no, no, that that's the authentic heart mm -hmm. right there. I mean, so please listen to this podcast again. The action item is so simple. Do the four H's. I, I, I'm going to read them back to you. Handwritten notes. I think you said five handwritten notes a day, but yep. you know, five handwritten notes, 
do the hot sheets, text three people who have some connection to something you find on this hot sheet off your MLS, something that you can give unique to them that shows about their, their neighborhood or a house near them or whatever it is. Do the happy birthdays, but be memorable in doing it. <laughs> and then do the high fives. What is so critical about the high fives that I wrote down is not just the liking, it's the commenting, standing out, being unique, everybody's liking. So in all these four H's that you're going through, it's about being unique, being different, creating memorable experiences. So when you get off this podcast, commit tomorrow, start doing these four H's. So simple. I'm challenging myself right now going, how do I do this for Reminder Media? How does Luke Acre do this four H's in his business? Because it's all about relationships. That's what it's about. Remember, the difference between a top producer and a mediocre producer in any business is top producers take action. Don't just listen to us put it into action and change your business so you can change your life 